Hi everyone, thank you for joining us today. We are Cold Health. We offer speech, OT, and physical therapy. And we are here today with Cole Academy, which is our AEA therapy department. And we have one of the best of the best, Veronica. Um, we love Veronica so much. She is one of the great essential things a part of Cole Academy. Um, I can say that professionally and personally as she has touched um, my son's life and changed his life in so many ways. So um, we are just so excited to have her and all of her knowledge and everything that she shares with us. Um, so we're going to go ahead and get started on her presentation. Um, we will have Q&A afterwards. Um, so stick around for that. Any questions you can put in the text chat box or you can email us anytime and get in touch with us at colehealth.com. And without further ado, Veronica, it's over to you. Hi everyone, I'm Veronica, as Wendy mentioned, thank you. Uh, today we'll be learning in the unnatural environment. Okay, so let's get started. And also thank you everyone for joining us today. We really appreciate it. So let's start off with what is applied behavior analysis or ABA as we like to say it for short. Science devoted to the understanding and improvement of human behavior. All treatments are derived from research using scientific methods. Anytime you are using the principles of behavior to change behavior, you are using ABA, regardless of the setting. Who are the practitioners of the science? We have our board certified behavior analyst or a BCBA who have master's degrees or a PhD level degree. We also have our board certified associate behavior analyst or BCABAs, which a bachelor's level degree. And these are the people who can design and train others. You don't have to be a B, excuse me, you don't have to be a BCBA or a BCABA to carry out programs based upon the principles of our ABA. Cole Academy Services. So our mission here is to successfully teach children with autism using applied behavior analysis. Teaching such as communication and language, self-help skills and independent skills, appropriate behaviors, social skills, classroom inclusion, and some of the methods and programs we use here are one-on-one, -on -one, our natural environment training, which is NET for short, our bridge program and quest program as well. There are a few reviews from the Autism National Standards Project from 2009. So there are 11 sites of the treatments established repeatedly with scientific research as effective with children with autism. Naturalistic teaching strategies include incidental teaching and NET developed from ABA literature was one of the 11 established treatments. So these strategies um, NET involve using primarily child-directed interactions to teach functional skills in the natural environment. These strategies include, but are not limited to, incidental teaching, embedded teaching, and natural environment training. Our main components here for NET is arranging the child to attract for desired items and activities and materials. The child initiates the teaching process by indicating an interest in an item or activity. The teacher uses the child's initiation as a teaching opportunity. The child's response results in a natural consequences. For example, contingent access to the item or activity of interest. NET can take place where a child needs to demonstrate these skills, occurs during normal activities of everyday life, includes eating, self-care skills, play skills, vocational tasks, and the activity itself is the reinforcer. Uh, the distinctive feature of NET is that it uses the child's natural environment to facilitate language learning moments by using the child's interest to guide the session. The trainer creates a learning opportunity by using objects that naturally occur in the child's daily environment using anything from a book, a baby doll, or even a breakfast table. The child's response, at least initially, is not as important as the child's natural gravitation to the items that are naturally reinforcing. 
Trainer also has the opportunity to use the child's own motivating factors or interests to facilitate therapy and guide instruction. NET also creates the ability to create much more verbal interaction than it's typical for the child throughout their daily activities while therapy is being implemented. This is because NET is focused around play since NET is done in the child's most natural setting. It also occurs when there is an activity more prominent or central at the time, during toy playing or even grocery shopping and transitioning. For the student, the continuation of the activity serves as a reward for engaging in another incidental activity. For example, naming colors, letter sounds, or even asking for items. Natural environment, natural environment training also incorporates journalization into training. It focuses the child's immediate interest in activities for instruction. It takes advantage of a teachable moment, uses natural reinforcers to teach language and all kinds of other skills, works on the level of the skill of the child. You can use NET to make every minute of everyday educational for the child. So why do we typically do NET? Performing in the natural environment is the ultimate goal. What do we teach? The things that child normally does or needs to learn to do. Where? The places the child naturally is during the day. So if we're teaching them to brush their teeth, we wanna teach maybe before bedtime or when they wake up. And when? At the times the child is usually in those places. How? We can help them by prompting and using reinforcement. Why NET? Because it increases generalization and ensures things being taught are relevant to the child's life. Transfers to intensive teaching sessions to increase response time and remove contentual prompts. It transfers from intensive teaching sessions to different people, places, and things. It all depends on the child. What are things that we can teach with NET? Anything and everything. So for examples such as communication and language, requesting naming objects or items, social interaction like greening and sharing, self-care skills like setting the table, hand washing, toothbrushing, play skills with toys, anything imaginative that you can think of, academics such as letters, numbers, shapes, reading, and math. Where and when do you teach with NET? Again, everywhere, all the time. At home, at school, and when you're at the grocery store, at the playground, neighbor's house, even 4th of July parties. Anything that you can think of. A few steps to NET are, you want to explore the child to find potential activities. Create a pattern, find that motivation. Don't talk too much or too soon. Be the reward. You want to pair yourself. Prompt the request and gradually build an easy skill to build generalization. So when you're exploring the child, what do they look like? What do they look at? How do they experience the touch? How do they experience sound? What do their assimilatory behavior look like? What turns them on as potential reinforcers? What do they like? Creating a pattern. So whatever the child does, do something different. Make sure you each have a role here. Wait for the child to take an action to maintain the pattern. Once the pattern is established, vary, vary it slightly. If you can create a pattern, try something different. You're looking for engagement, connection, and shared attention. Find the motivation. A movement, a sound of a toy, some eye contact, some behavior indicating that there is something the child wants or needs. What part of the activity does the child really enjoy here? You also want to be the reinforcer. Make the activity more reinforcing with you than it is without you. You want that they, excuse me, you want the child to come to you. You want to always pair yourself with being fun. You can also prompt the request. You can do echoics, fill-ins, provide choices. You can ask them what they would like to do. Uh, part, you can use our par partial verbal prompt. Nothing said, item is presented. 
or nothing said the item is present. You want to gradually build in tasks. So when you teach everything in the any natural environment, you want to start with easy demands that the child has mastered. Start with a low rate of demands and then gradually increase your rate of demands. Gradually begin to incorporate tasks that the child is currently working on in intensive teaching. How prompting and reinforcement works. So prompts are ways to help people become successful. We use prompts for people that don't know how to perform a specific task, for people that are having trouble with performing the tasks, to make information, information easier to understand, because we want the child to also be successful and not be frustrated. Follow through with the instructions using prompts. We've been giving you prompts all morning. Prompting sequence. If you want someone to do something, you first use a verbal instru instruction. For example, touch your nose. You only give one verbal instruction at a time and you don't want to repeat or seem like you are nagging. If the person does not follow the instruction, use prompting sequence such as a verbal prompt, a gesture prompt, so the gesture prompt will be uh, pointing at your nose or pointing at their nose. Physical prompt could be partial or physical. Partial would be guiding the hand towards the nose and a full physical would be hand over hand prompt to touch their nose. So the prompting sequence for NT with a physical response Let's say the instruction is stand up. You wanna wait for compliance. So you present the instruction, wait three to five seconds, then you can gesture prompt, wait another three to five seconds, then model, so model would be you do it yourself, wait again three to five seconds, then use partial physical, so wait three to five seconds and total physical. Always reinforce the appropriate behavior. Now, the prompting sequence for verbal response, let's say your instruction is, what do you want? You wanna wait for the compliance. So you, again, you present the instruction, wait three to five seconds, partial verbal, wait three to five seconds, full verbal, wait three to five seconds, then directive. So partial verbal would be, if you see them trying to reach for a toy, you can say, ta, kind of just the initial sound of the word. Uh, partial verb, I'm sorry, a uh, full verbal would have just saying toy. And then the directive would be you telling them say toy. And again, always reinforce for the appropriate behavior. And here's the hierarchy of the um, prompts. So instruction, gestural, modeling, partial physical and full, full physical is for the physical prompts. The verbal prompts would be the instruction, partial verbal, verbal, and directive. And a lot of examples um, that I have here are prompts used for mans during NET. So a fill-in would be get ready, set, and the child would say go, and you immediately reinforce. A co-it, you want to push, and they would immediately um, echo you by saying push while you're on the swing. Choices, you can present two choices. Did you want the green or the blue chalk? You can also just ask them, hey, what do you want? You can say the initial sound of the prompt. So green, if the, you are telling them to choose green, you can sound green. Nothing said and the item is presented. So you have the chalk presented for you and the uh, child asks for the chalk that he sees. Also, nothing can be said, the item is absent, and you have the chalk behind your back, and then the child will ask for the chalk. So ultimately, what, what should prompt behavior? In the natural environment, the, the presence of dirt on hands prompts hand washing. Getting ready for bed prompts tooth brushing. The presence of another person prompts hello. Reinforcement, so reinforcement are kind of like rewards, the main reason people do things. Reinforcement comes after the behavior and it increases the future occurrence of that behavior. 
If a behavior happens more often after a specific consequence is given, that consequence is a reinforcer. So if, uh, if you give a reinforcer after a behavior, that behavior will increase. If the behavior decreases or stays the same, what you gave was not a reinforcer. How to properly give those rewards? Only after the behavior you want happens, also immediately after the behavior you want. Give an appropriate quantity as well as quality. Don't give stale cookies and don't give oh, the entire whole cookie. And this is this a new or a mastered skill? Satiation or deprivation? Value changes over time. You wanna give reinforcement constantly. There are many types of rewards and must be something that will increase the behavior in the future, such as maybe it could be a social praise like hugs or just telling them, great job, I love how you did that. Uh, tactile, auditory, visual, auditory, gustatory, and movement and activity. And these are the little cute little pictures on there. Advantages of using praise and feedback as positive reinforcers. So praise and feedback are always available and it costs nothing to provide. Everyone loves to hear that they're doing a great job, right? It is normal for people with and without disabilities to receive those praises and feedbacks. We rarely get tired of being praised. I know I don't. Praise and feedback can be provided without disrupting and ongoing activity. What is pairing? It's important that because it established you as a reinforcer. How do you do it? Be the one to deliver those good things. Spend the time doing things the person likes to do. When possible, help the person to avoid things that are disliked. You wanna spend time in close proximity, learn to communicate well with each other. Once rapport is built, then we are ready to create some learning situations. So again, how to pair. Identify as many rewards as possible. You wanna make sure you have a large supply and wide variety of reinforcing items to give the child. Approach the child and deliver the reinforcement non-contingently, so you're just giving them praise constantly for free. The child does not need to request or earn those reinforcers in any way. Maximize the number of times that you provide reinforcement. You wanna break and edible rewards into smaller pieces so that you can hand the child more frequently those cookies or any edible that you use. Deliver multiple rewards at once. TV, food, toys, sensory stimulations, anything that the client enjoys. Try to deliver rewards several times per minute. Talk to the child, but don't expect them to talk back. Follow the child's changing interest, finding new things in the, in the, excuse me, finding new things if the child gets bored. Actively manipulate the environment and interact with the child so that you are required for maximum enjoyment of the activity. So for example, if this child is on the swing, the parent pushes the child. The child is thirsty, parent fills child's cup a tiny bit at a time, or the child wants to go outside and the parent unlocks and opens the door. Common parent mistakes, so these are things that we want to make sure we avoid, placing demands on the child until paired. So resist the urge to try to teach the child by asking questions or making the child work for rewards. It is necessary to first build rapport with the child before doing any type of teaching. You don't want to rush with pairing. It is important that you are seen as fun. If it takes you 10, 15 minutes, go ahead and use those 10 and 15 minutes versus five minutes. Lack of active interaction with the child. So pairing is something that you are actively doing. Um, so this is the part where you are constantly talking to them or providing those reinforcers. Uh, pairing will not be effective if the therapist is just sitting in the room while the child is doing their own thing or being on her phones, right? The therapist must continually act as the giver and the child should function as the taker. Infrequent or weak reward. If strong rewards are not given frequently, then pairing will be less effective. 
find as many opportunities to reinforce the child as possible, maybe several per minute. How to determine if pairing has been effective. Questions to ask. Um, questions to ask yourself. Does the child run to you or away from you? Does the child follow you when you leave the room? Once the child is frequently and willingly to approach you to obtain the reinforcement, you are ready to begin teaching verbal behavior in the natural environment. How to gain the instructional control. It all begins with pairing. Again, you are becoming the reward. Beginning to fade and demand slowly and systematically. Maintain those boundaries of rewarding behaviors you want to see and not rewarding inappropriate behaviors used to gain access to attention, escape, or any tangibles. Nothing good should ever follow an inappropriate behavior. So let's talk about a little bit about shaping. So this technique is used when the child initially does not have the target behavior in his or her repertoire. Prompting and rewarding successive approximations of the skill, and it uses related responses in the child's repertoire. Rewards those and then only reward closer and closer approximations to the goal behavior. How do you shape a behavior? Excuse the sound, I could not figure how to remove it. So you want to select the target behavior or end goal, identify the child's skills with respect to the target behavior, reward successive approximations to the target behavior. What is considered an approximation? So there are steps toward the target behavior that are similar to the target behavior. So you, have, you start off with approximation, let's say you want them to eat a, take a bite of mac and cheese, maybe touching the noodle to the lips and tolerating it for five seconds. Once they mastered that, I'm sorry, you immediately reinforce and once they mastered that, maybe licking the noodle from the spoon, reinforce immediately. Once they mastered that, um, you will maybe have the client leave the noodle inside the mouth for five seconds, then eventually chew it and eat it, which is the target behavior is eating the mac and cheese. And every close approximation that they get to, you want to constantly always reinforce. So shaping sign language during NET, teach how to sign book. Start with the rewarding, start with rewarding a hand clap. Then only reward hand clapping one time and open hands. When, then only reward moving to clap, but stopping to open and close hands to sign book. Shaping vocal output language. So start by reinforcing whatever sounds a child makes, then move to shaping the vowel sound. Move to cons consonant, vowel, syllables as soon as possible. So for example, you go from ooh to moo for movie. Never reinforce when a child adds an inappropriate sound. Teaching language during NET. So teaching language is based on function of the word, not form. A word serves many purposes depending on the context. Language operants, expressive language, so man's our request. It is that, let's say, in the presence of juice, the child requests for a cup. Tax are labels, so let's say the child says cup when they see a cup or a picture of a cup. Introverbals are talking about things that are not there or beginning stages of a conversation. When asked, what do you drink milk out of, the child responds, a cup, without a cup being present. Tacting by feature, function, and class. When shown three pictures and told, tell me the one you drink from, the child says, cup. Receptive language. So it's when shown three pictures, given the, the instruction, point to cup, the child points to the cup. With receptive by feature, function, and class, when told to point to the one that you drink from, the child points to a cup. Each operant serves a different purpose and each should be taught during NET. Motivation during NET, does the child want to be in the situation? 
in the natural environment, the teacher must identify, contrive, and capture the student's motivation in order to teach skills. NET is meant to be fun. Be cautious of the ratio of demands related to the fun activities and statements. We can quickly turn it into work without noticing. Play during natural environment training. Excuse me. Play is a combination of the following. Engagement in the environment, manipulation of items, utilizing items as representations of the real things, creating representations of things without props, such as imaginative play, joint attention, sharing attention to some items or activity with others, language with intimate objects to others, social interactions with or between inanimated objects or subjectory with others. During play during NET, it often times play skills develop naturally. When they don't, each component of play needs to be examined, broken down, taught individually, and then all together put back together. How ABA can be useful in teaching play skills. So let's say the activity is painting, right? The targets or requests are colors of the paints, maybe asking for the paintbrush, labeling of paper. Uh, receptively, they can get the paper, discriminate between colors, known uh, one-step instructions. They can label colors, items on a page, shapes of items, conversations such as our, which are our introverbals. They can do categories, functions of items, or even animal sounds. So we can also create our own. So activity could be rolling a, ca a car down the ramp. We can identify what color of the ramp is or which car they would like. You can present options by using which car do you want to use or play with. There could be lots of social skills and turn taking with uh, rolling a car down the ramp. Remember what we said about instructional control and building that rapport. We are teaching language, shaping, play, prompting, and always using those reinforcements. All of these are all important in NET. Okay, so I would like to thank you for joining us and let's give it to Wendy to, uh, if there are any questions or answers that I can help you understand with, let me know. Thank you so much, Veronica. I'm going to end the recording right now.